Welcome. Today we'll be discussing the reprocessing of reusable medical devices and the FDA, recent FDA trends with regard to these types of validations. My name is Julie Barrett. I am the Department Manager of the Cleaning and Disinfection Department in the Hospital Reprocessing Section here at Nelson Laboratories. Before diving in, I want to give a quick definition of reusable de device reprocessing. This is the process to decontaminate any device that is used in a healthcare setting on multiple patients. These devices must be properly cleaned, then sterilized between patients. This next slide is a visual of some common reusable devices. As we move through the presentation, keep this visual in mind as some of these can be very difficult to reprocess. At Nelson Laboratories, there are three main guidance documents we follow. They are listed in this slide. This is not a definitive list, but it includes the ones we reference most often. Recently, the guidance that has most affected medical device manufacturers and their subsequent reprocessing instructions for use, or IFUs, is the FDA draft guidance for industry. This guidance arose as a response to concern over hospital-acquired infection. The manufacturer's responsibilities, as outlined in this new guidance, are as follows. You must provide instructions for use for your device. These instructions must be clear and concise. Additionally, they cannot be so difficult and tedious to perform that a healthcare worker will have trouble carrying them out. The areas of focus for a manufacturer's IFU are determining a clinically relevant test oil, worst case contamination scenarios, worst case cleaning instructions, what soil residuals to look for in your test plan, determine the acceptance criteria for your test plan, and finally, proving without a doubt that your device is rendered clean using provided instructions. The purpose of the cleaning phase of reprocessing is the removal of contamination from an item to the extent necessary for further processing or for intended use, and it is the critical first step in reprocessing any device after it has been used on a patient. Failure to remove foreign material, for example, soil, organic and inorganic materials, lubricants, and microorganisms from both the outside and the inside of the device can interfere with the effectiveness of subsequent disinfection and or sterilization. This is relatable to placing a dirty casserole dish in the dishwasher. If you do not first remove food residuals, they would baked onto the dish by the end of the dishwasher cycle. There are two types of risks that are associated with the reuse of a medical device. The risk of disease transmission from one patient to another or from environmental sources to a patient, and the risk of inadequate or unacceptable device performance following reprocessing. An interesting point to consider when setting up a test plan for, for a reusable device, which could also be part of your worst case condition, is something called end of life testing. Every reusable device must have the exact number of times it can be reprocessed and still retain its functionality listed on its label. Each time a device is used, it develops wear, such as etching or pitting. As wear and tear develop, the device becomes harder to reprocess. By validating the effectiveness of a reprocessing procedure on a device at the end of its life cycle, you are able to prove the effectiveness of that procedure. In other words, if your device can be reprocessed at the end of its lifespan with all the wear and tear associated using your suggested instructions, then those instructions are solid. One hurdle with performing this type of testing is the difficulty in obtaining enough devices from the field that are at the end of their life cycle. Another way of setting up the scenario is through repeat processing. This would entail taking the set of devices needed and putting them through the number of reprocessing cycles listed on that device's label claim. On the last cycle, the validation is performed. If the device label lists that it can go through 10 cycles before it's rendered non-functional, then you reprocess the device 10 times, an example would be 10 cycles of cleaning, disinfection, and sterilization. Then on the 10th cycle, an attempt is made to validate the IFU. These repeat cycles may or may not include simulated contamination of the device. This would be best determined by submitting your proposed test plan to the FDA. Let's now move on to setting up the test plan for cleaning validation, the first phase of reprocessing. The first thing to determine is how many devices are needed. It is recommended to use a minimum of three test devices and a concurrent positive device. Recently, FDA is trending toward requiring more than three test device replicates. Again, this can be determined by pre-submittal of your test plan. The positive device is a device that has gone through the contamination procedure along with the test devices or process devices, but has not been cleaned. 
This device will show the starting amount of test oil that is on the devices, which will then help to show how much of the soil was removed. The test device, or process device, is one that has been contaminated and has gone through the full cleaning process following the IFU. This device will show how well the cleaning procedure worked with the contamination process that was used. The negative device is a device that has not been contaminated or cleaned. This device will show if there was anything on the device prior to the contamination and cleaning. The negative device is recommended when testing protein, carbohydrate, total organic carbon, and endotoxin. One additional test plan consideration is the reproducibility of the cleaning validation. Recently, FDA has been trending toward requesting data from three replicate runs of the cleaning validation. In other words, performing the test plan three separate times with data generated for each. This is typically performed on the same set of devices. Perform, this would mean performing the validation three times on the same five devices as listed in the scenario on this slide. This slide gives an overview of each step of the cleaning validation process. The devices are contaminated, cleaned using the manufacturer's IFU, extracted, then tested for residuals as outlined in the approved protocol. The manufacturer has to be ready to justify the decisions made in each step of their test plan. An intimate knowledge of how the device is used is needed to accomplish this. This not only includes what it comes into contact with, but the engineering behind the device with regard to how soil adheres to it and the effect of cleaning agents on its materials. Without this knowledge, it is difficult to put together and justify a chosen test plan. Once the number of devices to use is determined, the next point of consideration is which soil to use. Some questions to think about are what parts of the body does your device come in contact with? Does it breach the sterile barrier? What body fluids does it come in contact with? What is the consistency of those fluids? Does it see tissue or bone? All of these are important questions to ask when determining which soil to use in a test plan. This next slide lists some commonly used test soils. Although these are published, they may or may not be clinically relevant to a specific device. In some cases, a mix of two of these test oils will represent clinical relevancy. DBLSO is a good representation of a thick blood soil. Huckers is meant to represent feces or fecal matter. Miles test oil can represent a mix of blood and mucus or a pus-like substance. This particular soil is not very thick, however. British can represent a pus or mucus. Again, it is important to remember to determine the soil that will be worst case for the device. After the test oil has been determined, it is time to define the contamination process. How is the device utilized in surgery? Does it get immersed? Does it get handled by the physician? Does it see spray from body fluid or a combination of these actions? Is the device actuated during surgery? Is the device and used and or actuated then set aside several times throughout the surgery? Next, determine how long the surgery time is so that the device dwells in the contamination fluid for the correct amount of time. Finally, how long is the time between the patient procedure and when the, when the reprocessing begins. Does the test oil dry on the devices? The most important thing to remember is to set up the test plan so that it mimics the worst possible scenario in the clinical setting. In this slide, you'll see a simulation of soil being sprayed onto a device, in this case, scissors. This slide shows how the device would be actuated during the contamination process. The soil is sprayed on, then the scissors are opened and closed to simulate use. Once the scissors have been contaminated, it must be determined how long it will take in a worst case situation before they are reprocessed, 30 minutes, 8 hours, 1 or 2 days. Recently, the FDA has been asking to see soil dried on the devices during the validation. This particular picture shows the way that many healthcare facilities transport devices to central processing. The dirty devices are placed into a metal pan and a wet towel is laid on top of the pan to keep the soil in the devices from drying. Although this is commonly used in healthcare facilities, recently the FDA has been asking to see soil dried on the device during a validation. Now that we've gone over how to choose a clinically relevant soil and how to contaminate using a worst case scenario, we'll move on to how to set up the validation of the actual cleaning process. When setting up an IFU, you need to keep in mind the environment that the cleaning is being performed in and the human error that can occur if the instructions are not clearly written. Personnel in the central processing area of a hospital are working in, in conditions that can make complex and tedious instructions difficult to perform. If your device requires disassembly, 
It should be easy enough to perform with gloves on, safety glasses, and other protective wear. Additionally, it must be able to be performed using tools that are readily accessible. If they are not, then they must be provided and able to be decontaminated themselves. Lastly, you must consider the worst case cleaning instructions, which would include minimum soak times, minimum rinse times, and so on. To determine which detergents should be used for the cleaning validation, it is necessary to know which detergents are used at the healthcare facilities where the device will be sold and or utilized. Additionally, you will want to know what materials the device is made of. Some detergents may have a negative effect on specific device materials. Also, what will the device come in contact with? If a heavy amount of protein is present in the soil, the detergent should, con should contain proteinases. If there is fat present, then lipase and so forth. Some manufacturers decide to use a lower concentration of detergent and an enzymatic detergent that only contains one enzyme in order to create a worst case condition during the validation. Sometimes in healthcare facilities, detergent will be prepared in a basin for the purpose of soaking, then loaded with multiple devices. This can overburden the enzymatic activity and should be considered when determining a worst case scenario. If marking your device overseas, you would also need to take into consideration the types of detergents used in those healthcare facilities. Are they alkaline or acidic? Do you need to employ the use of a neutralizer? The cleaning test plan needs to mimic exactly what will occur in the healthcare facility and the IFU you are attaching to the device should be utilized. The cleanability of the device is very important. Are there hard to reach areas, mated surfaces, springs, lumens? Can these areas be flushed appropriately? Does sonication need to be employed in order to reach these tight fitting areas? Does the device need to be disassembled to clean appropriately? Can it be easily disassembled? Is the cleaning procedure too lengthy or too complex? Can personnel and central processing reasonably perform this? There should be an automated and manual cleaning procedure in place if at all possible. The automated cleaning procedure helps eliminate the possibility of human error. Additionally, it is safer for the healthcare worker. However, there may not be a washer disinfector in all faci facilities where the device is used. Therefore, a manual cleaning process is important as well. If your device is unable to be processed through a washer disinfector, significant justifications should be provided. <coughs> One other thing to consider is although you may perform the validation worst case, <coughs> You, sh you could still have your IFU outline a better case. Some examples are as follows. You could validate a diluted detergent, but list a more concentrated detergent in your IFU. You can validate a lesser soak time, less than the detergent manufacturer's recommendations, for example, but list the actual manufacturer's soak time in your IFU. You could validate your cleaning device in the assembled configuration, but require disassembly in your IFU. Your test plan would be set up so that the device would be contaminated and cleaned assembled and then extract and disassemble. This would show whether or not you were able to penetrate the interior areas of your device and clean it appropriately. This slide shows an example of a washer disinfector. When validating an automated IFU, here are some things to consider. Is this a complex device? If so, there may need to be manual pre-clean utilized. Some washers are not set up to spray inside lumens or tight-fitting areas. A quick soak and flush in detergent prior to placing in the washer is an example of a manual pre-clean for a lumen device. Most washer cycles include a thermal disinfection phase. This phase must be excluded in order to assure that you are assessing the cleaning phase of the cycle. A thermal disinfection is performed at high temperatures and cre can create kill. For cleaning validations, only removal of soil is evaluated. The drying phase performed by the washer should also be excluded. This too is performed at high temperatures and therefore does not represent a worst case scenario for the validation. The same detergent considerations that were listed for manual cleanings should also be taken into account for automated cleanings, for example, pH, enzymatic activity, and availability. If you are including a dry phase in your washer cycle, you can list it in your IFU, but leave it out of the validation so as to represent a worst case scenario for the validation. If you are including a thermal phase in your washer cycle, you must assure that it is validated separately as a thermal disinfection validation. This type of validation involves attaching sealed glass ampules containing organisms to the devices, processing the devices through the automated cycle, then testing the reduction of the organism. Disinfection validations will be touched on later in this presentation. 
At Nelson Laboratories, we use a fully programmable Theris 444 washer disinfector. With this washer, we can mimic almost any cycle, whether it be domestic or overseas. The current slide lists the parameter capabilities of this washer, including the default settings. The default settings would represent the worst case scenario and therefore would be best to, would be best to try and use in the test plan. With the default settings, healthcare personnel do not have to specially program a cycle in. Another thing to consider is the configuration of the device in the washer and what that worst case scenario would look like. If the device is from a tray, it should be placed in the tray when being processed through the washer. It is also always good to have dunnage in the washer during the validation. The device would never be processed by itself in the washer. The first step in determining the effectivity of a cleaning procedure is visual inspection. The naked eye is most common. However, a boroscope or a magnifying glass can be utilized to better see tight-fitting areas or inside lumens. Another way to visually inspect, although costly, would be destructive testing. In this scenario, the device is broken, disassembled, or cut into pieces, then visually inspected to assure soil is absent from the interior. This can be performed for devices that are unable to be disassembled, but need proof that the suggested cleaning procedure works. After visual inspection is the extraction process. Each device is placed into a container and extraction fluid is added. It is preferred to extract the devices disassembled to ensure extraction of all surfaces. The container is then extracted using either sonication, manual or orbital shaking, or flushing. During these extraction processes, the fluid washes over the surface of the device and pulls off any remaining residuals. Aliquots of the fluid are then tested for residuals outlined in the test plan. It is very helpful to have the surface area calculated prior to performing cleaning validation. This allows the lab to better calculate the appropriate amount of extraction volume to use and to present the results in micrograms per centimeter squared, the, accept, the suggested exception criteria outlined in Amy TIR 30 2011 is listed this way. Recently, the FDA has been trending toward requiring extraction efficiency. This process will tell you how extractable the device is. As explained in the previous slide, extraction is performed by placing a device into an appropriate container and adding the extraction fluid. Then, the appropriate method is employed. This is considered one extraction. One extraction is appropriate for the process test devices as they have been cleaned and would not have a lot of residual to remove. This same reasoning is applied to the negative device, although it is not processed or contaminated as part of the validation. For the positive device, since it serves as the baseline and has not been processed, one extraction may not be enough to remove all soil present. By employing extraction efficiency on the positive control, you would repeat the extraction procedure four separate times and approach counts of zero by the fourth extraction. Each extraction has its own fluid, and each extraction fluid volume is evaluated separately. If the device generates a high extraction percentage, then it proves that the device is easily extractable. This then, leads more this then lends more validity to your one extraction that is performed on the process test device and the negative device. A high percentage is achieved when most of the residual soil is removed in the first extraction. I will now turn the time over to my colleague, Alpha Patel, who are presenting the second half of the presentation. Thank you, Julie. Hi, my name is Alpha Patel, and I'm a department scientist of the cleaning and disinfection department in the hospital reprocessing section here at Nelson Laboratories. For the last portion of the webinar, I will, I will be going over the recent FDA trends regarding testing residual cleaning markers and the, F and the emphasis of using these markers for the cleaning validations. Once the devices are extracted, the extracts are analyzed for a number of tests, which we call residual testing cleaning markers. These markers are listed in TR30, and the selection of what markers should be tested depends on what your device is coming in contact with and what would be suitable for your test plan. Not all cleaning markers need to be validated. You want to choose what will be applicable for your product. At least two cleaning markers are recommended for the validation. Protein is the number one marker and is usually accompanied by TOC or carbohydrate, which has been the current trend. 
But keep in mind that TOC does not have acceptance criteria outlined in TIR 30. Therefore, the reasoning of using this marker would have to be justified by the manufacturer. The reason for testing cleaning markers is because any organic or inorganic materials that is left on the devices after, after reprocessing can interfere with sterilization or disinfection process. Historically, BioBurn has been the most common residual marker to be tested. There has been some concern on testing spore formers versus vegetative or clinically relevant organisms. We recommend testing the spore former because it is the hardest organism to remove, but we also recommend testing at least one vegetative organism and preferably a gram-positive and a gram-negative organism. Here so we give some examples of the test organisms that should be tested. The most common organisms that are tested are Geobacillus sterothermophilus for the spore former, Ischia coli for the gram-negative, and Staphylococcus aureus for the gram-positive. Now this does not mean that you have to test all three organisms. These are recommendations and you want to test what is relevant for your device type. I want to emphasize about longer dwell times with vegetative organisms and the concern of organism die-off because we don't know if the, if the die-off in the dwell time or if they were removed in the cleaning process. Bioload reduction alone is no longer accepted by the FDA since reduction of viable organisms cannot be directly correlated to device cleanliness. If bioload reduction is to be tested, it should be in conjunction with other soil markers. The acceptance criteria as outlined in TR30 is that there must be at least three log reduction after the cleaning process has been performed. The most common method of evaluating biburn left after the devices that have been processed is through the membrane filtration method. This picture shows an example of how membrane filtration is performed. The first step that is performed for membrane filtration is that you first place a sterile filter on the sterile filter housing, and this step is performed in a way to avoid cross-contamination and ensuring aseptic technique is maintained during plating. This picture demonstrates how aliquots of the extract are plated for the membrane filtration method. Lastly, the filter is carefully placed onto the auger using sterile forceps aseptically. And then the plates are placed in the incubator for appropriate time and an appropriate temperature for each organism plated. The counts are then enumerated after the incubation and a log reduction value is calculated. Selective and differential media is used to avoid contamination and for easy recognition of organism colonies. Protein is one of the most popular test residual for cleaning evaluations, probably because most of the body fluids, blood, secretions, serums are, are composed of protein and is a major soil component in medical devices. It is tested with a micro BCA protein test, a standard curve of protein concentrations, and a UVV spectrophometer is utilized to determine the exact amount of protein on each device. The limit of detection is 1.1 micrograms per mil, and the acceptance criteria outlined in Amy Terra 30 is less than 6.4 micrograms per centimeter squared. Because the FDA likes to see the final results reported in micrograms per centimeter squared, the surface area of the device is needed. To calculate the micrograms per centimeter squared, you take the surface area of the device and divide that by the micro, by the centimeter squared of the device. Hemoglobin is usually tested for devices that come in contact with blood and has been one of our popular residual test testings for cleaning evaluations that is needed. The hemoglobin test is qualitative test since the analysis of the sample is performed by hemostix reagent strips. But the use of a standard curve, the results are quantitative and reported as such. The procedure used to evaluate this marker is considered to be a semi-quantitative analysis. The limit of de detection is 0 0.5 micrograms per mil. And the acceptance criteria outlined in TR30 is less than 2.2 micrograms per centimeter squared. Carbohydrate analysis is usually performed if biofilm residues are a concern and if you are interested in evaluating how much carbon is left on the device after the reprocessing of the device. 
carbohydrate is detected using a phenylsulfuric acid test method, using standard curve with maldotexin, and using UV vis spectrophometer at a wavelength of 489 nanometers to detect the level of carbohydrate in the extract collected after reprocessing. The acceptance criteria as outlined in TR30 for carbohydrates is less than 1.8 micrograms per centimeter squared. Endotoxin is usually tested for devices that come in that come in contact with cerebral spine fluid, brain matter, and eye tissue. If testing for endotoxin, the soil used for the evaluation of the cleaning validation is spiked with a gram-negative organism such as E. coli to simulate the presence of endotoxin. Endotoxin residuals are tested by mimulus amoebocyte lysate kinetic tubermetic analysis. The sample is mixed with lysate in a 96 well microplate and incubated. And the samples of the extract are analyzed through a UV vis spectrophometer at 340 nanometers. This test is also pH de dependent. Optimal pH for analysis is between pH 6 and 8. If the pH falls out of, out of that range, it can cause inhibition. The acceptance criteria outlined in TR30 for endotoxin is less than 2.2. EU per centimeter squared. For total organic carbon, the wet oxidation method is used to determine the amount of total organic carbon in the extract. The TOC test is a two-part reaction in which the samples are first purged of total inorganic carbon, then sodium persulfate and phosphoric acid is added. Secondly, the oxidant reacts with the organic carbon to form carbon dioxide, which is purged and detected by non-dispersive infrared. The acceptance criteria is 12 micrograms per centimeter squared, but keep in mind that this acceptance criteria is not specified in TR30, but it is referenced in a webinar that was presented by Amy in December of 2006. Detergent residuals is also one of the uh, cleaning markers that we test, it does not have an acceptance criteria, so it is not one of the most residuals tested, but it's usually tested with MEM, which is minimal essential media, and that is tested through, through cytotoxicity testing, which does have an acceptance criteria. So when testing for detergent residuals, we usually um, ask the manufacturers to test for MEM first. The acceptance criteria specified in TR30 is determined based on Dr. Alpha's study of the endoscopes. Therefore, these criteria are just baseline values that can be used to establish the acceptance criteria for your device, if appropriate. When determining what, a, what the appropriate accepted level for your device would be, the manufacturer needs to have, with regard to their device's actual use, how, it, how is it used in the surgery, how is it typically cleaned, how long does it dwell before decontamination? What does it come in contact with? This may take research on their part, but it's absolutely necessary. The FDA wants to see thoughtful consideration of why, why um, they choose their test plan when they submit their 510K. Although protein and TOC seem to be the trend, you still need to have thoughtful justification behind your decision. Destructive testing is another form of reassurance of your cleaning process. By performing destructive testing during and after repeat cycle testing, it gives you a perspective of how well your reprocessing procedures are. When I talk about reprocessing procedures, I'm talking about cleaning followed by a sterilization or a disinfection process. End of life testing is another thing that the FDA is starting to look into. This validation entails testing the validated reprocessing procedures multiple times to evaluate the life of the device. Each cycle is usually composed of a cleaning and a sterilization or disinfection depending on what was validated for your product. This is tested by performing functionality testing on the process devices between cycles and performing a cleaning validation at the end of the cycle. Determination of the life of the device is the responsibility of the manufacturer and common number of cycles we see evaluated for reusable medical devices is usually between 50 to 100 reprocessing cycles.
for sterilization, it is important to to reference the right standards. ST79 tables four and five have the have the procedures specified for them, and and that's all, and that's what the FDA likes to see. All the manufacturers use TI12 also has another one that um, is another standard that people should be looking at when they are about to um, validate their sterilization process. Sterilization chambers and all accessories, BI trays, pouches, wraps, should be FDA cleared for the intended use. Worst case load configurations should also be tested. The new guidance document has specified seven criteria for labeling and should, and should address for clear reprocessing instructions to help users understand and correctly follow the instructions. Number one, labeling should reflect intended use. What this means is that the labeling should include instructions for a reprocessing method that reflects the physical design of the device, its intended use, and soiling and contamination to which the device is subjected during clinical use. Number two, thoroughly clean the device. What this references is in general the effectiveness of each step in the reprocessing of a reusable medical device will influence the thoroughness of the cleaning and the importance of ensuring the instructions to the user result is thoroughly clean. Number three, microbiocidal process, sterilization or disinfection. The microbiocidal process shall evaluate, shall be evaluated through the recommended process of sterilization or disinfection, which is categorized in three categories, which is high, intermediate, or low-level disinfection, depending on the intended use of the device. For sterilization, the validation must be consistent with current infection control practices, and standard parameters from SD79 should be used. Sterilization chambers and all accessories must be FDA cleared for the intended use and worst case load configurations should be tested. If the devices cannot withstand the heat of sterilization, then disinfection is usually the choice and is validated. FDA recommends, FDA recommends that all, all critical devices that, um, and these are devices that come in contact with blood should be sterilized. The FDA guidance document goes over different levels of disinfection in detail and what the devices should be considered for what level. Thermal disinfection is also, is also a common way to disinfect the devices. This is performed in an auto, this is usually performed in an automated washer using ampules. This type of disinfection also has the same levels of disinfection criteria that are in the guidance document, high, intermediate, and low. More information on this can be obtained from a, a CDRH document, which is a class two special control guidance document for medical washers and medical washer in the industry. Four, reprocessing should be technical, technically feasible. This section focuses on multiple items, such as equipment and accessories needed to to implement the instructions and should also be available in the intended location. For example, the FDA recommends that the instructions specifically for sterilization parameters that are technically feasible should be used for the validation so it will be easier for the user to program them. Number five, use legally marketed detergents and disinfections. The draft guidance document has specified websites where the manufacturers can obtain a list of FDA clear detergents and disinfectants to be used in the validations. Six, instructions are comprehensive, and this emphasizes on reuse life testing. This section of the document focuses on things like accessories used in the validation should be clearly identified in the instructions, such as special tools, sizes of brushes, sterilization wraps, and so on. Method of cleaning, manual or automated. If disassembly steps are required, explaining each step in detail and diagrams are encouraged. Identifying the cleaning agents to be used, any lubricants needed after cleaning, rinsing steps, including duration and volume used. Method of visual inspection, method of disinfection and sterilization. And lastly, reuse life information, 
which indicates how many times can the device be reprocessed before it's no longer feasible for use. The inst seven, instructions are understandable. The instructions should be clear, grammatically correct, legible, and in logical order from initial processing step through the terminal process steps. The instructions should be written in a simple language, and the words such as if applicable and minimum should not be used in the instructions. The next steps of this slide show how important it is to use standardized test soils for evaluation and, and standardized repeat processing steps, how the instruction should be clear and established acceptance criteria should be the manufacturer's responsibility for any cleaning validations. Thank you for listening to our webinar on reusable device reprocessing validation and recent FDA trends. If you have any questions, please contact us and we will be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you.